you have a theory, you theorize cancer as a response to injury. And, and I guess your, your entire practice is now based around this theory that injury repair response that did not get turned off because of an environment that's created ongoing growth and inflammatory signals. Um, so that's, you know, and the idea, if we go back to 80% of adult cancers being adenocarcinomas that are arising from a glandular lining of the epithelial cells, it, it, it that all sort of starts to make a bit of sense. Good, good. Yeah, I, I want it to make sense because I believe that healing is very attainable and it doesn't always have to be drug based. And it, it actually starts with those day to day boring decisions that you make about what am I going to have for breakfast? What am I going to have for dinner? And, and those, those questions that we, we often think of these as boring and unimportant things because we just want to get on to our next really important thing. But, but there's, when you're managing a disease process like this, I would argue that there's nothing more important than changing your soil, creating soil that's going to grow healthy cells, or cut down on the weeds at least, and, and to basically restructure your body so that it's functioning in health. And, and that's how, you know, one little boring decision at a time pays yeah. off three years down the track. It takes about three months, maybe not quite so long. Some epigenetic studies in, in, the, the laboratory have shown that epigenetics can be altered with six weeks of changes. And what does epigenetics or, mean? Epigenetics is, is what's around the gene. And so there are a lot of things that determine what genes are going to be expressed. The interesting thing about the Human, human Genome Project was that it ended up being a bit of a fizzer because we thought that was going to be all the answers once we got the gene sequence of, of the human genome. But it turns out that we're far more than just the sequence. There's folding patterns, there's little sulfhydryl groups, there's methyl groups, there's acetyl groups. There's a lot of different things that determine whether a gene is going to be expressed or whether the transcriptional enzymes are going to have access to that, whether that will be incorporated into a ribosome and, and you know, manage to, you know, go into the next generation of cells. And, and there's a whole lot of matters that, that are, we're just beginning to understand. And, and the, the problem is we're changing these things through CRISPR and genetic engineering and various things that we, we have no idea how this is going to ramify on future generations or even this present generation in terms of how our bodies regulate themselves. Yes. Yeah, there is the, the potential for a heritability factor. And so we, we know that with the gene, the gene doesn't change much, but DNA doesn't change much. But over time, what changes are the instructions. And so that's the epigenetics changing how the gene functions. And that's probably how humans have been able to adapt to lots of different environments. That's um, right. And, and so it's, it's really important to understand that these instructions can create the terrible environment that promotes cancer. But, you know, and what you say is a, it's a restoration of communication avenues to remove and reduce the injury and the growth of the inflammatory signal. Correct. That's correct? That's correct. Because if we're not sending injury signals, we're no longer transducing that signal to the nucleus and saying, hey, we need more of this particular type of cell to come over here and you know, create a new breast, even though I'm sitting here in the spinal cord and you're recruiting more breast stem cells into that space. And that's actually what's happening. And, and when I tell patients that they realize that their cancer really is stupid because I think we, we, people think their cancer is smarter than them or smarter than their body. And, and we, we have to just accept that this is just a, a biological adaptation that's gone wrong their body made it, it's, it didn't move in to try to kill them. And if their body made it, there must be a way of reprogramming that as well. And I think that's a potential that people don't think about. 
And, you know, I, I think going forward, I hope we will, because I yeah. think that's really where we need to go. We don't need another, you know, kinase inhibitor or whatever that no one can even pronounce anymore. I mean, the design of the drug is all about a, an intellectual patent of a specific molecule. Mother Nature has, you know, if, if we don't change the soil, as it were, the natural selection process dictates that Mother Nature will just move over here and do it another way. And, and, and that's what I mean by, you know, taking your foot off the gas pedal as you're applying the brake. So pharmaceuticals become a very finite break and they're all about intellectual patents and all about shareholder profits. And some of these drugs work really well and I'm, I'm glad that we have them because they give patients a bridge while the patient is coming in and doing the hard yards of changing their biology a bit so that they're no longer recruiting. And those patients in my experience do remarkably well. I love getting people, you know, to understand these principles early in the piece so that they are actually not gaining more recruitment. And we also have found that certain dietary factors are going to increase the sensitivity of certain chemotherapies, um, which is, which is amazing. So this um, is really, this is really interesting. So, so you're saying that, you know, you've got the bridge, which is, can be surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. And then while this part of the bridge is being built, you're also putting the foundations in, which is good nutrition, um, you know, cleaning up your act so that you don't keep growing cancer. Then, um, then you get through that three to six months and then you can start you're basically creating a foundation that's not inflammatory so you've had that tran transitional period right but in addition sometimes it's beneficial to change your diet because then you will respond to cancer treatment better absolutely there are certain things in curcumin for instance studies have actually shown that it improves the sensitivity to paclitaxel and we know that because of the uptake of certain nerve poisons in the nerve, um, the peripheral nerves, um, that when someone's on a ketogenic diet, the nerves aren't taking up as much poison because they're trying to extract glucose. And when someone's got a low glucose, the nerves are more protected. So I've got patients that are able to keep getting some of these neurotoxic drugs for years on end without getting peripheral neuropathy whereas many patients who aren't changing their diet are able to get one round and they've got permanent peripheral neuropathy. Um, so so it, it, it basically allows you to have more options when we understand how all this works and fits together. And, you know, coming back to your question about surgery, you know, surgery is a very important thing and it can actually cure very early cancers. But if we are not judicious in who we select for surgery, if someone's got a borderline resectable cancer and the cancer has already breached the borders of, you know, a certain organ or basement membrane or whatever, sometimes it's better to give those patients chemotherapy up front, or sometimes it's better to skip surgery. Like for some men that have very advanced prostate cancer, for instance, that's invaded seminal vesicles gone beyond the capsule, high Gleason score, that means very mitotically active, those men are probably not going to be cured with surgery. And, and then we have the injury that goes with the surgery. So when we have a high grade cancer that's locally advanced and we go in trying to resect it, we've created a whole region of injury signals. And so of course that cancer comes back there. Of course, it's metastasizing. We have systemic inflammatory mediators that are sent throughout the body. And so it's, it's hard to, for us to get patients before surgery, but I, I love, I used to think that was a really advantageous place is when I had a locally advanced, um, a, a person with a locally advanced cancer to be able to bring them into anti-inflammatory diet plan, get them on some chemotherapy, and oftentimes we can shrink the tumor down by 50, 70, 80%. Sometimes it'll completely go away. And then that's creating new dilemmas. If you completely have a cancer go away, do you even need surgery then? So 
So there's a, a, a lot of advantages to standard therapy. Um, you know, in, in the prostate cancer case, you know, you, it's not known to be a particularly chemotherapy sensitive disease, but, you know, we do use chemotherapy for prostate cancer in a certain subset, but, you know, radiation therapy can contain cancer in that region without creating the injury signals. In fact, it just causes things to scar down instead of actually, you know, opening up the blood vessels and making it easier for those malignant stem cells to go circulating throughout the body. And is that called the dandelion effect? Yeah, that's, that's, I don't like that, but it, everyone gets that. That's, mm. that's kind of what happens with metastasis. Everyone can identify with, you know, how random that event might be and how we would want to keep things contained locally because it just becomes that much more difficult. Um, I, I don't worry about dandelions in my yard and, um, and, and because I've, you know, if you, dandelions are there to basically, um, detoxify the soil. So I don't worry about dandelions, but you know, a lot of people do and, and we, we, we go after them with poison and all the rest. So it's, it's a relevant model for, for cancer, but um, it all depends on how you think about the dandelion as well.